chapter number one of Esther. Probably not the normal lady we talk about a whole lot, but we're going to read about Vashti this morning. <clears throat> Starting in verse number nine. And Vashti the queen made a feast for the women in the royal house which belonged to King Ahasuerus. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mehuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, and Abagtha, Sether, and Carcass, the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Ahasuerus the king, to bring Vashti the queen before the king with the crown royal, to show the people and the princes her beauty, for she was fair to look on. But the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. Then the king said to the wise men which knew the times, for so was the king's manner toward all that knew law and judgment. And the next unto him was Karshina, Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Marys, Marcina, and Memucan, the seven princes of Persia and Media, which saw the king's face and which sat, sat the first in the kingdom. What shall we do, he asked, unto the queen Vashti, according to law, because she hath not performed the commandment of the king Ahasuerus by the chamberlains? And Memucan answered before the king and the princes, Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes and to all the peop people that are in all the provinces of King Hashirus. For this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women, so that they shall despise their husbands in their eyes. When it shall be reported, the king Hashirus commanded Vashti the queen to be brought in before him, but she came not. Likewise shall the ladies of Persia and Media say this day unto all the king's princes, which have heard of the deed of the queen, thus shall there arise too much contempt and wrath. If it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, that it be not altered, that Vashti come no more before King Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. Father, thank you for just being here today. Thank you for the promise of your unseen hand. Thank you for your grace and mercy. We ask today that you will open our understanding to understand the truth of your word. In Jesus' name. Do you remember the story of Charlotte's Web? How the faithful little spider, Charlotte, wove a sign over the pig pen to save Wilbur from the butcher block? Remember what it said? Some pig. Well, this Ahasuerus, this Xerxes, was, according to his own thinking, some king. And he's the imperial character of our study. But I just wonder what God thought of him. You know, we may truly think we are some person, but what counts really is what God thinks. And this first, this first chapter of Esther is really a story about the imperial, pivotal character. It's a story about a king who got too big for his britches. It's a story about an all-powerful king who really wasn't all-powerful. A king who could rule others and cities and countries, but he couldn't rule himself. It's a story about who and what really was the king's master. And it's a story about a brave queen who said no. It's a story about how a domestic dispute became a national crisis. <laughs> and about a king who had to learn the hard way, if he ever did, that he wasn't in charge, that there's a God in heaven, that other people have wills of their own, and that he wasn't always right. And it's a story telling us that it is eternally important who you choose as your prime minister. That's the whole, whole story 
The whole book is all about that. You know, as long as we sit on the throne of our own heart as king, we forget all that, and we think we are some king. Well, in our study of the main character of this book, we discovered a wonderful heavenly father who just always has the interests of his special people at heart, and he's not just some king. He is the king. <clears throat> in Hashirus, whose name means venerable father, we discover a character who only has his own interests at heart, and he's a character that we do not want to be like. And the book starts out with the account of a 180-day feast. That's really the first of nine different feasts or banquets in these ten short chapters. Eating and drinking and being merry was what the king and his cohorts did the best. And during this feast that we have an account of here, Hashirus showed off his riches and his glory. But one writer said a man's pretty poor if he can show all of his glory and all of his wealth in six months. And in fact, he's probably showing all this to several different groups during that time. So it didn't even take him six months to show off all of his wealth and glory. And sadly, his character is declared by the extent of his material kingdom and measured by the surveyor and recorded by the historian. And yet, you know what? Today it's all crumbled into dust. Nothing left. John, so John reminds us that this world is fading away along with everything that it craves. But if you will do the will of God, you will live forever. And so Paul urges us, set your sights on the realities of heaven and let heaven fill your thoughts and do not think only about things down here on earth. One rendition of that verse that I found was, constantly set your location by heaven. I like that. You know, lest we drift, lest we lose our focus, lest our vision just gets all clouded and blurred up, we need to just every so often set our location by heaven. It's just, <laughs> these are days when we need to do that more than ever. Just set our location often by heaven. So this king could rule 127 provinces. He could order everybody around, and he could have things just about the way he wanted, and he could control everything and everybody but himself. And when he didn't get his own way and his ego took a blow, he could become angry, and you find that more than once through the book of Esther. The wise man said, he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city, because he that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. So this king, this king made some impetuous decisions that later he regretted, and he was susceptible to flattery. Whoever got to him first, just like... Um, and so, just to kind of summarize all that, a man is actually poor if he can show all of his wealth in six months. <laughs> and if he lets his temper get the best of him, and if he must entertain his guests with wine in abundance, that's, that's a pretty poor man. So at this point, the king Ahasuerus orders Queen Vashti to be brought to the banqueting hall to show the people and the princes, her beauty, for she was fair to look upon. And I just tell you, a man's really, really poor in his character and in his soul and in his manliness if he's willing to expose and sacrifice his dignity and the integrity and the dignity of his queen. The name Vashti doesn't appear for very long or very often on the pages of Holy Scriptures, ten different times. Seven times in chapter 1, three times in, in chapter 2. But she appears long enough to evoke much discussion and teach us valuable lessons. Really, really, what kind of woman was she? Was she stubborn and rebellious and vain? Or is she noble and dignified and godly? 
And depending on who you read after, she is excoriated for her vanity, her rebellion, and her selfishness. Or she is praised for her virtue and her dignity and her proper choice. You know, was she a noble woman who prized her modesty and her self-respect above her royal estate? Or while she was entertaining the women in the banqueting hall, did she defy the king in an act of drunken bravado, kind of bolstered by the reveling crowd of women who vicariously were enjoying the taste of female revolt? (laughs) Well, whatever the case... Case without the actions of Vashti, who knew there would be consequences to her actions, but who did not know what the whole future would be, without her actions would we have had an Esther. And without an Esther would we have had any restraint on Haman. And without that would we have a Jewish nation today. Was Vashti merely a pawn in the palace intrigue, or was she a key player in the hand and providence of God? Ahasuerus used her and threw her away, but God never throws anyone away. We often say that no one is indispensable. And and I know that we mean that life will go on, that someone will always be there to step into the gap, that we ought never to become so vain that we think the world cannot exist in at least as good a form as it is right now if if we're taken out of the way. And Paul said, A man is not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, and be not wise in your own conceits. And Corporations and governments and armies and ball teams, they all look at men as expendable. But from God's viewpoint, every man is eternally important. And no one else can stand in the place or fulfill the gap that God has planned for you. We must reverence the humanity of every man. No one for whom Christ has died can be common or worthless to esteem anyone worthless who wears the form of a man is to be guilty of an affront to the Son of Man. So never undervalue a man, no matter how bad or how unlovely he may be. Every man is valuable in the eyes of God. You know, some try to downplay the significance of this incident by by claiming Vashti to be a mere concubine or a minor wife. But if she was... She wouldn't have been the one giving a banquet for all the wives of the cabinet ministers. And she wouldn't have been sent for in such a formal, courteous manner as with seven chamberlains, the king's closest counselors. That's pretty important. And she would not have had access to the crown royal. And she would not have needed to be replaced in such an elaborate procedure. So she was a, 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 a full queen. And she was no doubt the queen. In fact, in old, in, old, in old Persian, her name means the best. And in modern Persian, Vashti signifies a beautiful woman. And so she must have been of a beautiful countenance and a goodly form and probably kept herself well with, with self-respect. And hopefully there was a charming grace in her motion and a pleasantness about her spirit. There was another king who had a wise mother who taught him that favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. In other words, charm is is deceptive and beauty doesn't last, but a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. Physical beauty is the gift of God, and is not, it is not to be despised, but beauty is only skin deep. And beauty is vain if it's only used to, to gain favor and get your own way, and yet it covers over an unlovely inner disposition and character. So it's, so it's P 
Peter who cautions us, don't be concerned about the outward beauty that depends on fancy hairstyles and expensive jewelry or beautiful clothes. You should be known for the beauty that comes from within, the unfolding beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is so precious to God. That's the way the holy women of old made themselves beautiful. They trusted God and accepted the authority of their husbands. And there can be the combination of physical beauty and moral loveliness. The beautiful woman may, by divine grace, give forth the sweet fragrance of godliness. And her kind and thoughtful deeds may become glad songs in this weeping world. And, of course, it's, it's also possible to be named Vashti and yet not be the best or the most beautiful physically and yet, on the other hand, be the best and beautiful in character and in spirit. Years ago, we, we pastored a precious saint at Lucisboro, and she was a little short lady and she probably wouldn't have won a, a physical beauty contest. But I tell you what, she'd step up the one little step into the church, and she'd struggle sometimes to make that step. And I'd say, how you doing, Grandma? Oh, just endeavoring to serve the Lord. And lots of, and was, if you've been to Lucisboro, it's kind of a small uh, sanctuary. But before she got to her seat, off and off and off, and she would just be shouting and praising the Lord. And most of the time, you're talking to her normally, you had the strain to hear because she was so soft spoken. You, you could hear her when she got serving the Lord and <laughs> praising the Lord. And I just remember, maybe this is a rabbit trail, but I, I just, as I was thinking about this, I remember one time she had to be out for several weeks or something, and so I took communion down to her, and Barrick was with me, was two years old, and we got there, and I had forgotten my, my grape juice. Well, she had some Kool-Aid in the fridge, so that's what we used, and we had communion, and Barrick's sitting on my lap, and she took a shouting spell around her kitchen, and Barrick's eyes were let be. And I don't, I don't suppose he remembers that now, but I tell you what, it had to be an impressive impression on his heart. She was, just, she was just a beautiful saint. And I thought, I was thinking, when I was a kid, we, our family used to sit over in here, and Sundays would just, it'd be all be crowded. Just, there were seats over here, and seats, and every, it was all full. And I just remember more than one year, there was a young, well, he, he probably looked old to me. I'm not sure what his age was. I think maybe he's from the Maslin Church, and I don't even know his name. And he'd usually sit up in here, and he was kind of crippled, and he would, he would just, he wouldn't run, but he would just be shouting and shining. I mean, just shining. It was just remind me of Stephen, and this, just his face shone. It just has stood with me all these years. I don't, he's more than likely he's in heaven by this time. But, oh, I tell you, that's the glory of God. And, oh, Vashti was the best, and she was of a, a beautiful countenance. I, I just inwardly, may the Lord help us to be the best. This morning I was reading Psalm 45, and just it's a story about the king and the bride being prepared. And Down in verse 16, I start meditating on this, and I'm probably not ready to say, to. I'm not ready to preach on it, but I was meditating on it. It says, says, instead of thy fathers shall be thy children. Instead of thy fathers shall be thy sons. And I begin to think about that. I've talked to you about, you know, seeing God come and move. And, and I, used to, I used to talk about the old guys in the conference. And a while ago, I woke up to the fact that <laughs> the old guys are gone. I'm one of the old guys. <laughs> But, you know, I just, I think of how they used to shout. And they led us in the right way. But our sons need to see that. Our sons need to see that. It, needs to, it, it wasn't just for our fathers. It wasn't just what my dad saw, what I saw. I want, I want that same spirit, that same glory of God to be in our midst until we just, until we just see God. It's not just for our fathers. It's for our sons. All right, let's get back here to the message. All right. 
And you know, you could be named Vashti, and you could have an appearance of beauty, and yet be greatly lacking in your inner man. And so the, the first lesson to learn here is to make sure that your character matches your name. If you're Sarah, if you're the princess, be a princess who is just noble and good. If you're Peter, if you're the rock, be a rock, be a stalwart, steady person. If you're Onesimus, be useful. Don't become a thief. Don't become useless, but be profitable, be useful. If you're Vashti, cultivate a beautiful character. Don't be like Sardis. Remember they had a name that they were one thing, but they were exactly the opposite. I know thy works. You have a name that thou livest, but you're dead. So don't live a fake life, and don't be a hypocrite, and ask God to make you true and keep you true. And if you bear the name of Christian, be what that means. Be Christ-like. And if you can't be the best in physical appearance or intellectual powers or in skill, you can be the get best that God can make our yielded soul in divine loveliness. I just found this the other day. The highest spirituality is the most utter helplessness and the most entire dependence and the most complete possession of the Holy Spirit. That's what makes us beautiful. That's what makes us the best. That makes our soul lovely before God and useful to this world. So now, as, as the scriptures and the story is written, and evidently it was owing to the customs of the day, the, the, the men could feast together, and the women were excluded, and, and they must have their own feast. But the better rule, and the whole tenor of scripture is, that men should never conduct themselves in such a manner as to make it necessary to exclude the society of virtuous women. Women need the strength of the men, and the men need the refining touch of the ladies, and no man should ever go where a virtuous and a high-souled lady cannot enter. Matthew Henry said that while the king showed the honor of his majesty, the queen and her ladies showed the honor of their modesty, which is truly the majesty of the fair sex. However, the condition of women in antiquity and in many eastern lands today was little better than a slave. If married, she was the property of her husband. If unmarried, she was the plaything or the slave of a man, but never his equal. The morality of married life, which is the strength and the glory of any people and the glue of society, was hardly known in those days. And in the feasts, of this first chapter, there's lots of laughter and there's lots of merrymaking. And I tell you, there's a, there's a merriment which is wholesome and, and good. But there's a merriment that's injurious. There's a humor that's holy. Someone said that God must enjoy humor. That's why he made monkeys. So... so, so. <laughs> You know, it's pretty amazing how the author of Esther uses some strong humor to tell his story. We laugh at the self-serving, confused politicians. What do we do now? What do we do with this lady? <laughs> and we're amazed at the quirky emperor. <laughs> and we just shake our heads at the, at the ludicrous, self-glorying, self-destructive villain. And we'll get to that story, and I just, I, I love that. I love his story. I'm sad about his story, but I'd love to read it anyhow. And we smile at how the all-powerful monarch is brought up short by one member of the weaker sex. He could rule everybody in every province, but what do I do with this Vashti lady? And we rejoice at how those all-powerful Persian men are just outwitted a little later on by a Jewish woman. Don't you love that story? Well, you, God, you know, God made us to laugh, but Paul warns us against shoddiness and smuttiness in our humor, and there's, there's a humor which is not holy. 
He said, but fornication or, and all uncleanness and, or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saint, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Obscene stories and foolish talk and coarse jokes, these are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. If our name is Christian, there must be a carefulness about our thought life, about our actions, about our fun and our humor and our joking, and it all must be kept on a high and a clean level. It bothers me when I hear God talk and then people veer off into the smutty ditch. Ugh. Stop the God talk or stop the smutty talk. The merriment of a hashirus caused by drink soon led to a foolish command. And when the heart is merry with wine, the head gets wrong. And then the merry heart too often becomes a broken heart. And his foolish command produced bitter fruit. This foolish command, which was evidently for Vashti to come and unveil herself and parade her physical beauty before a bunch of debauched, drunken men brought Vashti to the great crisis of her life. Those courtly words from the king brought an unlike, an unkingly intention. You know, be careful of the suave words of the wolves in sheep's clothing. And the question and decision before Vashti, and in various forms it comes to us, shall I be unqueenly and remain a queen? Or shall I be queenly and become unqueened? To every soul comes this crisis of life. Shall I save my life and lose it? Or shall I lose my life and save it? The call of Jesus is still clear today. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Will I confess or will I deny my Lord? Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. During those Hitler Nazi years in Germany, and I, the confessing church arose in about in the spring of 1934. Based on, because to that point, the church was, was controlled by the state and the ministers were paid by the state. And, and finally, some of them begin to wake up and realize this is not where we want to go. And they called it the confessing church based on Jesus' challenge to us to confess him before men. And it broke with the authority of the state and repudiated anti-Semitism and other heresies. And many leaders were imprisoned and some paid with their lives, including probably the most famous one was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. But those who paid such a price have been confessed before the Father by the Son. Amen. All through the ages before Christ and since Christ, men and women have faced this dilemma to serve God or serve self. Serving self has the immediate most visible rewards but brings eternal devastation. But serving God looks to be the most costly and it looks to be the losing proposition. But what about eternity? If Vashti had been simply a vain woman, proud of her physical beauty and willing to use it to her advantage, now was her great chance, the one opportunity of her life, and the desire to display her charms would have overcome all else. But she chooses to be and remain queenly, whatever the cost. And that, that queenly simply means to be noble and aloof from shame and above little things. And she rose superior to the seductive prospect. G. Campbell Morgan says that that statement, Vashti refused to come, 
is the one gleam of light in the picture of the conditions obtaining at the court of Ahasuerus. The feast in the palace of the king was characterized by all the gorgeousness peculiar to the east. It re had resolved itself, though, into a debauchery of drunken revelry. And in the midst of this, the king commanded Vashti, his queen, to his presence and to that of his drunken nobles. And she refused to come. She paid the price of her loyalty to her womanhood in being deposed. And that reminds us that in the midst of the grossest darkness, the human soul is not without some consciousness of higher things, and that among the least favored, we may at times discover things of real value and beauty. So let the name of Vashti be held in everlasting honor for her refusal. We don't know if she tried to negotiate or reason with the king, but who can talk sense to a despot who is inflamed with wine? We do know that she refused to appear in public unveiled or worse, regardless of the personal consequences to herself. She did know that refusal to obey could mean death or maybe worse. And certainly obedience and submission is due to those who are in authority over us, but the command of conscience is superior to the commands of husbands or kings. There is a danger lest the voice of our mere desire be confused with the voice of an, of a, of an awakened, faithful conscience. The commands must be prayerfully and carefully considered and examined, and we must obey the divine voice, which is firm and reasonable and scriptural and peaceful. And we were, we were exhorted and preached to last night to just cultivate and recognize that voice and hear that voice. The, the, the principle that the apostles laid out in those early days of the church when commanded to not speak in the name of Jesus was this, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So that kind of begs the question, is it ever right to resort to civil disobedience and to disobey those in authority over us? And I would say only if obedience would compromise principles of righteousness and godliness, and if, and if, and if you must disobey, we must also be ready to face and suffer the consequences. Why, the, the three Hebrew children said, we're not bowing, so whatever you want to do with us, do it. Daniel said, I'm not going to quit praying, so whatever must be done, must be done. Okay. The apostle said, we're not going to stop talking about Jesus, so whatever you want to do to us, you have to do to us. Paul to the Ephesians wrote, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. But he also exhorted, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And if a husband expects due obedience, then let them be reasonable in their demands. And what bothers me about Ahasuerus and about many men in our day is the willingness to allow their wives to be exposed in public before the leering, lusting eye of the world. I just don't get that. I hope, I, I think I'm, it seems like I'm preaching to the choir this morning, but I'm just going to say it, okay? <clears throat> and what a vain man Ahasuerus was by exposing the precious beauty and the peculiar treasure that was his alone. He lost it. And no person and no man should be allowed to gaze with lust upon the sacred temple of the Holy Spirit. Somebody wrote this. I have a co-worker who broke his wife's, his wife's modesty over the course of a year. He continually pressed her to, pre to dress more and more erotically when going to the gym because he wants other men to lust after her because he believes it's good for his self-esteem and he likes having a trophy wife. What a twisted, strange, sad, disgusting way to build self-esteem. 
So I just say, you know, where are the men? We need to return to the Vashti spirit, both men and women. It wasn't rebellion against authority. It was preserving honor and dignity and integrity and modesty. And it was firmly and decidedly and resolutely saying no to wrong and yes to the right. Somebody else wrote this, but I I just concur with every bit of this. I praise God for a wife who knows how to dress modestly and beautifully. She is a walled garden. Her glories are veiled glories. She's not funky. She's gloriously and unquestionably a beautiful woman, and yet she's not a billboard to every passerby inviting all to have a look. My wife didn't learn a lot of these things in church she learned them from the Holy Spirit and I don't know how many times we've been out and people said I like your hair is that all your hair she said yeah I've just done it this way for a long time (sighs) Alexander White who was a 19th century Scottish minister said that the sacred writer makes us respect Queen Vashti amid all of her disgusting surroundings. Whatever the royal order was that came to her out of the banqueting hall exactly was, the brave queen refused to obey it because her beauty was her own and her husband's, and it was not for open show among hundreds of half-drunk men. And in the long run, the result of that night's evil work was that Vashti was dismissed into disgrace and banishment. Only let us take heed to note that the sacred writer's whole point is this, that the divine hand was all the time overruling Ahasuerus' brutality, the unseen hand. How brave to stand against the greatest earthly power in the universe and say no to what was blatantly wrong. And although we must submit to proper authority, a wife's submission to her husband or any of our submission to authority does not mean that we must do wrong. Children's chorus is right is always, always right, and wrong is always, always wrong. Now, novelists usually always have virtue win because that's, that's really how we think it ought to be, right? It always comes out in the end. It's just no matter how <gasps> thrilling it gets in the middle of the book, it, al- it always comes out okay, so don't get too nervous about it. But that's, that's not reality in our disordered universe. The Josephs are not always taken from prison and promoted to prime minister, and not all the Jobs find their lost last state to be better than the first. And sometimes the Jameses are beheaded, and the Peters are crucified, and the Pauls are executed, and the Bonhoeffers are, are hung. And there are those who have trial of cruel mockings and scourgings who are stoned and sawn asunder and tempted and slain with the sword, who are consigned to wandering about destitute and afflicted and tormented, and and some like Vashti are taken off the stage and vanished at the very pinnacle of their career, all because they refuse to bow to wrong. And virtue is not always successful in this world. But virtue uncrowned is better than vice crowned. And we must not ever be so enamored with the garlands and the crowns of men that we allow our principles to go to the winds. A man without core principles is an empty, hollow man. He's a small man. He's a dwarf soul. No matter how powerful his position is, he's just an empty suit. About 70 miles east from where we live, there is a whole closet full of empty suits. If somebody could just get those suits and make something out of them, you'll figure that out. You know, we do live in a day when, when, when evil is counted good and good is called evil. But still, a true hearted Vashti is more rich in her degradation and banishment than the enthroned and worshiped Ahasuerus. Earthly crowns may be taken away, but the crown of divine approval cannot be removed by any external force. But ultimately, does virtue ever lose? 
Moral courage is a rare virtue in, these, in this cowardly world, and it requires courage of the first and the highest order to set in the balance, those qualities of uprightness and integrity and loyalty to the highest against those advantages which men prize, like position and status and comfort and wealth and the adulation of this world. <clears throat> Rare is the man or the woman who is not corrupted by power. There must be something within to resist. Daniel in Babylon just purposed in his heart. Joseph in Egypt said, how can I do this evil and sin against God? Naaman's little maid in Syria refused to become bitter or resentful, and she said, I know a prophet in, in Israel that could do something for you. If Vashti had been guarding herself and her own safety, we probably would never have heard of her. But now, untold multitudes have heard of her and read of her unusual display of courage and no deed, no matter how small or insignificant, done in the name of God shall be lost or forgotten by him who watches over everything and rewards all accordingly. George Hatch raised a large family of seven boys and five girls in the sand hills of, south, of northwestern Nebraska. One Sunday morning, a neighbor rushed over to help the hatches get their new-mown hay into the barn. Clouds were rolling up in the west, and it was quite apparent that a rainstorm was imminent. Let's get your hay up before the storm hits. Thank you for your kind offer, said Mr. Hatch, but this is Sunday, and I'm going to take my family to church. You, but you'll lose your hay. And yet the hatches went to church, and the rainstorm did spoil the hay. See, I told you, the neighbor said, I told you you'd lose your hay. Yes, replied Mr. Hatch, I lost my hay, but I saved my family. Amen. It's doubtful that the neighbor fully understood, but George Hatch did save his family. Amen. This was written several, several years ago, but it says today, down to the third and fourth generations, grandchildren and great-grandchildren are workers in the kingdom. Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things should be added unto you. I just say, don't sacrifice the permanent on the altar of the immediate. David Livingstone said, I will place no value on anything that I have or may possess except in relation to the kingdom of Christ. There are no safe battles, but there are no safe compromises either. I would be true, for there are those who trust me. I would be pure, for there are those who care. I would be strong, for there is much to suffer. I would be brave, for there is much to dare. I would be brave, for there is much to dare. This was good for our fathers. It's good for our sons. Let's not fail in passing on the baton. Amen. Let's stand.